everyone. Welcome to the Aquarium Online Academy brought to you by the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach, California. My name is Stacy, and in this episode, we are going to be looking at fish. So I hope you are ready to think fish because we're going to investigate why a fish is a fish, what makes them fish, um, and makes them a little bit unique. And then we'll take a look at some different fish out there, especially some of the really, really uh, kind of unique and interesting ones. At least I think they are. Now, if you have questions during this episode, we'd love it if you texted us at the number right here, 562-286-1838. That's 562-286-1838. And uh, that's if you are watching live. If you are watching after the fact and you are interested in emailing us a question, please feel free to do that. Our email address is live, L-I-V-E, at L-B-A-O-P dot org. So that's Long Beach Aquarium of Pacific dot org, live, L-I-V-E, at lbaop.org. All right, so let's talk fish. Take a look behind me. We have lots and lots of fish there. You may have recognized them, of course, as fish. What makes a fish a fish? I want to give you just a few seconds to really look at these animals and think about what makes them different from other animals in the world. All right, so hopefully you've had a moment to think about what makes these animals different than other animals in the world, because they are fish. Now, uh, there's actually uh, only a couple of things that all fish have in common. Then there's a few more things that most fish have. And the things that all fish have in common are a backbone. So again, we have that too. So we have a backbone. It's the bones that kind of go right along your back. Some fish, like sharks, it's not even made of bone. It's made of cartilage, like the top of your ear is. Um, but it is a spine, okay? So they have a spinal column. And the other thing is gills. Now, we can kind of see these ones here. Oh, it's actually a little bit tough to see their gills. But many of you know fish, right? They sit there and they go... And you can see their gills kind of flaring a little bit. And that's because that's how they breathe. So we actually have an animation to show you that kind of, kind of explains how these fish breathe. So we're going to bring up this animation now. My friend Alicia is actually working um, behind the computer here to bring us all the beautiful images that you're seeing. And Amanda is answering the questions. So please feel free to send us all of those questions. Now, this is how fish gills work. The um, water goes in through their mouth and it goes past the gills here. Now these gills are designed to take oxygen out of the water. Now our lungs, because we have lungs, we breathe air, right? When we breathe air, the, um, our lungs are designed to take the oxygen out of the air. Fish have gills to do the same thing but in the water. And yes, there are actually like, almost like little bubbles of oxygen dissolved into water. So that's what they are breathing. Now, um, you may be looking at the different pieces here. The gill arch, which is this thing right here that kind of arches all the way around, that has a little more structure. And that's what gives the whole thing structure because it is for the most part quite delicate. And if it didn't have kind of a stiffer piece like the gill arch, it could kind of end up in a ball. And then the water going past it isn't going to go past all the little bits and pieces, so the breathing won't be so good for them. So that's what the gill arch is for. These long, kind of spiky looking things, those are called gill rakers. And that is an important part of the gill because it's actually raking out particles in the, from, um, from the water. And that's an important thing because if the particles um, get on the gill filaments too much. So that's the part that, that they're actually using to breathe. If there's a lot of particles on it, they won't breathe as efficiently. So they can't get quite as much oxygen from the water. So again, uh, the gill filaments, that's this part right here, that's usually what we think of if you were to look at a fish's gill. That 
is what takes that oxygen out of the water. So that's a really important part of the gills. In fact, all three things kind of work together to help this little fishy breathe. So now we know kind of what fish gills more or less look like. Let's take a look at a fish skeleton. I actually have a fish skeleton over at my document camera. So we're gonna head over this way and take a look at the skeleton here. Um, now, if you look at the skeleton, you might notice some bones that are similar to us. For example, if you look at the head of the fish, there's lots of bones there, right? Just like we have bones in our head. Now, of course, they also have ribs, so you can kind of see the ribs right here. And then right, not on the very, very back of it, but right above the ribs, if you follow all the way back towards the tail, that is their backbone, okay? So yes, fish do have a backbone, as we can see here in our skeleton. And it's those two things, the gills and the backbone, that make a fish a fish. All fish have those two things. Now, other things that um, most fish have, if we take a look at our photo of our really cool fish that we had a little bit earlier, um, we can kind of see here, they have scales. This one is beautifully colored. I really love it. Not all fish have um, such vibrant colors, um, but many, many fish um, actually do have scales on them. Now, what do you think scales are for? Why do fish have scales? Now, it might help you to think about why we have skin right? If you want to text us your answer, you're welcome to text right here. If you have additional questions, please feel free to text. Uh, just remember, data rates may apply, and kiddos, make sure you have your grown-ups uh, permission, okay? So, um, we can see the scaling on this fish here, and if you've had a moment to think about it and you thought maybe protection, Absolutely. So our skin actually protects us from the outside world and, um, and fish's scales kind of do the same thing, except they're even tougher than our skin. So scales can be very, very um, good for protecting a fish. And another thing that a lot of fish have that you can see right here, back here, on the top up, oh, up there. <laughs> um, those are their fins. And a lot of fish do have fins, not all, but most fish do have fins. Why do they have fins? What are fins used for? Well, you may have guessed it. Uh, fins are often used for swimming. Now, fish can use their fins a little bit differently depending on the kind of fish. So we'll take a look at, um, and maybe we can even see how some fish move uh, in some of the videos that we have or even our, um, our webcams. And you can kind of see uh, what the fish are doing, how they're moving those fins to help them swim. So as we look here at our Antheus exhibit, this is one of the most colorful exhibits here at the Aquarium of the Pacific, one of our warm coral reef <laughs> exhibits. Oh, thank you, fish, coming right up here. Can you see what fin they use to help them push them through the water? If you're saying their tail, nice job. So these fish are using their tail, they're swinging it back and forth, and that's pushing them through the water. Now, not all fish use their tail to push them through the water. There are other fish that actually use their side fins, or we call them pectoral fins. And some of them kind of frill them around like this. It's really beautiful. And some of them go like this. Whoop, whoop, whoop. They go up. And it's kind of fun to watch. So when you uh, see any videos of fish, I challenge you to look at how those fish are moving around and how they use those fins as they move around. Now this fish right here is a really common one in Southern California where we are. This is actually the California state fish called the Garibaldi. And this is a really good example of a fish who uses its side fins or pectoral fins to push it through the water. All right, now we do have uh, a couple questions here. How many species of fish do we have here at the Aquarium of the Pacific? Benjamin, thanks for that question. That was a tough one. Um, we have about 500 different species, so that's quite a good number, and about 8,000 individuals. So if you were to count all of the fish here, somewhere around 8,000 or so. And then we have, um, oh, and Benjamin also asks, what do fish eat? Well, a really good way to know what the fish eat is to look at their face to take a look at their mouth. Um, when you look at a fish's mouth, you'll get an idea of how big their food is going to be, okay? So if it has a really big mouth, what kind of food do you think it gets? 
pretty big food. If it has a smaller mouth, it tends to be smaller food. Uh, another really interesting thing is also to look at the mouth position because some fish have a mouth like our frogfish friend here. Oh, don't want to say that too many times fast. <laughs> our frogfish friend um, has a mouth that's pointing up. So where do you think the food comes from? That's right, it comes from above. So the frogfish rests on the bottom of the ocean and its eyes are pointed up and the mouth is pointed up and when something comes by, it just grabs it and swallows it. Now frogfish are really interesting because this mouth is also very big for uh, this general size fish. So it tends to eat really big prey even though it's kind of a smaller fish. So again, looking at its face, that's the best way to know what they eat. Now there are other fish out there that have their mouths on the bottom of them. So if you think about that, where would their food be coming from? From underneath, exactly. So something like a stingray. A stingray is a kind of fish that has its mouth on the bottom and it actually cruises over the ocean floor to slurp up food on the bottom of the ocean like shrimp or even shellfish like mussels and clams that have a hard shell, they can crush it because they have very special teeth designed for crushing a shell to get to the meat on the inside. So here's a really awesome picture of that stingray mouth um, right there on the bottom side of it. So great question, Benjamin. Thank you. We have Gage in Arizona asking, do yellowtail eat squid or tiny fish? Yes! Both. <laughs> That's a great, uh, a great guess. They actually do eat both things. Again, look at the size of their mouth. They're probably going to eat it. <laughs> All right. So now we, uh, we have kind of figured out what makes a fish a fish. And we can probably think of a lot of fish that have a lot of the same things like, like the fins and the scales and the gills and the backbone. But there are some unique fish out there that may not have all of the things that we think of when we think of fish. So I'm going to have my friend Alicia here bring up a fish that is kind of a little bit more unique. And we're going to talk about how they're unique. What is this fish? This is definitely a seahorse. And this seahorse, believe it or not, is actually a fish. So if you think about like a tuna or a yellowtail, they don't look anything like a seahorse, right? Seahorse are really uniquely shaped. They're also kind of move in a unique way because of that shape. So if you look at its face, right? Oh, it's moving too fast. Right here on the side of it, um, it's frilly. And it's going like this really, really fast. And that's one of the things that helps it move. Also, if you look toward the back of it, the dorsal fin, that's also going to be kind of moving like this. And that's also pushing it through the water. Now, if you look at the shape of the fins and how fast those fins have to move, but how slow the seahorse moves, you can see that this is not going to be able to outrun a lot of other fish or outswim a lot of fish. So um, one of the things that they have that really helps them out is the ability to hide. So seahorses are masters of camouflage and often you will find them uh, holding on to something with their prehensile tail. So that's that tail uh, that we can't quite see but it's right down there. That's a tail that can actually grasp. So it's holding on to the seagrass here and it's hanging out in the seagrass just swaying with the grass. And its camouflage is keeping it protected from um, any predators that might be looking for it and also the prey that it might be eating. Now we were saying, how do you know what it eats? Take a look at this mouth. Big, small, what do you think? Quite small, right? So seahorse mouths are really tiny, so they're going to have to eat very, very small things. In fact, uh, here at the aquarium, they get kind of different types of plankton um, and they're going to be eating it like almost like a straw. So their mouth opens a little bit and then they suck in the food, just like you would use a straw to drink a drink. Okay, so um, that's kind of how a seahorse eats. Now, besides the shape, what makes them unique is the fact that they don't have scales covering their body. Instead, they have these kind of bony plates with skin covering. Um, so they're kind of unique in that way. But they are still fish because one, they have a backbone, and two, they have gills. All right? So that's how we know that it's a fish. What's that? Oh, let's like take a look at, um, at its cousin, the sea dragon. 
Now, this is a sea dragon. What does it have in common with the seahorses that we were just looking at? How would you know that this is a cousin of a seahorse? If you're saying that it's in the face, I agree with you. They actually have very similar faces to, um, to seahorses. This long snout with a tiny mouth at the end. These animals will eat mycids, which are like teeny tiny little shrimp. Um, and that's like one of their favorite foods. Now also right above me, you can see that that dorsal fin that also moves really fast when, uh, when they're moving. That's one of the ways that they can push themselves through the water. Now, do you think these animals use camouflage? Absolutely. Where they live, there's a lot of seaweed around. And that's one of the reasons why they look like seaweed is because they are floating around with the seaweed. They can swim too, um, but they look a lot like the seaweed. And that's really great camouflage, again, to hide from predators, but also to hide from their prey. It'll be much easier to get to your prey if, uh, if they can't see you in the first place. Now, seahorses and sea dragons are also unique because it's actually the males who hold on to the eggs after the females lay them. So um, the mama seahorses will lay the eggs in the papa's pouch. So seahorse this little pouch and mom lays her eggs there and the daddy seahorse is gonna hold on to those eggs until it's time for the babies to hatch. And when it's time for them to venture out in the world, it almost looks like the seahorse sneezes. It goes like, whoo, and then, a bunch of little seahorses, baby seahorses pop out. Now those little seahorses look a whole lot like their parents, just shrunken down to itty bitty. Now sea dragons on the other hand are really unique because instead of having a pouch, the underside of their tail is almost like a sponge. And if you look at a sponge, there's lots of little holes, right? Like little cups. And the female has to lay the eggs, one in each of the little cups in the tail. So that's really, really hard to do, but they can figure it out. And then the daddy seahorse holds onto those eggs. A very thin layer of skin actually grows over them to keep them secured to his body so the eggs don't fall out. And, uh, and eventually those eggs will hatch and the baby, seahorse, uh, the baby sea dragons looking just like their parents pop out and kind of take care of themselves from there. Now you may be wondering, about the sizes of seahorses. This is something that kind of blows my mind. The smallest seahorses in the world are called pygmy seahorses. There's about seven different types, but the smallest pygmy seahorse is about the size of a grain of rice. If you're not sure what that looks like, see if somebody in your house has rice. It's pretty itty bitty, and that's full grown adults, the size of a grain of rice. The biggest ones out there can be over a foot long, about 13 inches. So much, much bigger than a grain of rice. And that's the different types of seahorses that uh, live out there in the ocean. Now, how many uh, different species of seahorses are out there? About uh, 47 or so um, that we know of because we haven't really uh, had a chance to discover everything in the ocean. There's actually a lot of unknowns in the ocean. And believe it or not, 14 out of the 47 known species of seahorses have been discovered in the last eight years. So people are still discovering new things all the time. In fact, the teeniest seahorse out there was uh, really just documented a few years ago. So there are a lot of uh, new things to discover out there in the ocean, even things like different types of seahorses. Very cool. Now, another animal that I really, really love because they have a unique life story um, is a fish called a flatfish. Now that's a very general term. There's a lot of fish out there called flatfish. If you think about how they got their name, it's because they look like a fish. That is flat. <laughs> that is right. It almost looks like somebody sat on a fish. Now this fish is really interesting. Take a look at it. What is unique about this fish? Because it's similar in shape to, you know, most fish that we think of like tuna. Um, it, it has that same kind of oval shape. It has the fins. It's covered in scales. So all of those things are the same. Of course, because it's a fish, it has gills and it has a backbone. But this fish is laying on the sand. It's really interesting. Flatfish are known to lay on the sand. In fact, they have 
expert camouflage, um, just like this one here, this halibut lying on the sand here. But another thing you may notice is its mouth is kind of odd shaped. And wait, this is an eye and that's an eye. They have two eyes on the same side of their body. Now, I told you that these fish have a very unique life and then they absolutely do. When these fish are first hatched, when they are itty bitty baby fish, they're see-through. So they, you don't really see anything at all. But, and this is actually um, not when they're very first hatched. So when they first hatch, they look just like any old fish. They swim upright, they're in the water, the tail is here, they have an eye on either side, the mouth is in the front, just like any old fish that you would normally think of. Now here's the crazy part. Shortly after they hatch, they start swimming a little bit crooked and a little bit more crooked and a little bit more crooked until they're totally flat. Now while this is happening, the eye on one side of the body is moving up, up, over, and to the other side to meet the other eye. And then they end up with two eyes on one side of their body and they swim like this, like a flying carpet. It's really bizarre, but you can see these ones right here. This happened really young because they're still see-through, but you can still see the two eyes on the same side of its body. So very unique life. And then once they actually um, kind of grow up a little bit and they start having color to them, the side that we typically see, like if it's laying on the sand, <laughs> see if you can find the flatfish in here, um, the side that we typically see has lots of colors and those colors are going to match their surroundings just like that fish right there. But the other side of it, the belly of it, that we cannot see that's you know, touching the sand is usually white. And that's because you don't really need that color down there if you're laying on the bottom of the, um, of the ocean all the time. Plus, if it was actually swimming like this and there was something underneath looking up, that white belly matches the sunlight coming from the surface of the ocean. It's bright up there and that white belly matches that brightness. So even having a white belly is camouflage. What we call that is counter shading. It's when an animal is darker on the top and lighter on the bottom. And you can definitely see that with, um, with different flatfish, but you can also see that with um, a lot of other animals in the ocean. Think about an orca whale. That is another whale, or another animal that has counter shading, that darkness on the top and the white belly. Take a look at this white shark, the great white shark here. Same thing with counter shading. Light on the top, dark on the belly. And so it didn't just uh, evolve with fish like sharks and like the halibut, but even with things like penguins and whales. So there's lots and lots of different animals in the ocean. And this is a really good way to camouflage. Counter shading is found in a lot of animals that you see in the ocean. All right, let's answer a few more of your questions here. Melody asked, is the body system of saltwater fish and freshwater fish exactly the same. Um, it's close, but it's not totally the same. Um, the difference really is in being able to handle the salt. So if you were to take a freshwater fish and put it in salt water, it wouldn't survive. And if you were to take a saltwater fish and put it in freshwater, it wouldn't survive. And that's because the way their body deals with salt is different. So that's kind of the biggest difference. Now, here's the crazy part. There are some fish that switch between the two. So a salmon is a really good example of that. And here at the Aquarium of the Pacific, we also have steelhead. Steelhead is part of the salmon family. These fish are actually born or hatch in fresh water, up in like usually mountain streams. That's where they hatch. And then they make their way down the stream into the river and out into the ocean where it's salt water and their body has to adjust and change. This is a really cool word. You do not have to remember it, but I think it's one of the coolest words out there, 
smultification. Smultification is what you call it when their bodies change to allow them to live in salt water. Now they go out there into the ocean and they live a life and they become adults. And when it's time for them to lay eggs, they actually have to head back to the fresh water. So they swim all the way back to the mouth of the river. Their body has to change again so they can handle the fresh water. Then they swim all the way back up to where they were hatched and they lay their eggs there. So there are some fish that are quite unique and actually can live in both, um, but not all fish can do that. Great question, Melody. Oh, we actually have um, something called our online learning center. And this is a, a place that you can go on the Aquarium of the Pacific's website to learn about a lot of different animals. This one in particular is about the California um, coastal steelhead. So again, that was the, the fish that we were just talking about, part of the salmon family that can live in both fresh and salt water. So a very neat fish to get to know. Uh, some of you may actually know them as rainbow trout. So that's their freshwater name. Steelhead is their saltwater name. They're really, really interesting animals, and I encourage you to learn more about them if you are interested. All right, another question we have is, why can salmon and eels live in both fresh and salt water when spawning? Oh, we just talked about that. Excellent. All right, um, we have another question here. Um, are the eyes on the same side of their body when they're born? And I have a feeling you're talking about those flatfish. Well, just um, if you didn't hear it, they are actually not. So when they first hatch, they have an eye on this side and an eye on this side. But uh, it doesn't take long, like hours maybe, sometimes days. I, I don't know. It depends on the type of flatfish. But the eye actually moves up and over as they start kind of changing the way that they swim. So it moves up and over and joins the other side. So very strange critters. Okay, here we go. Here is a flatfish. Can you find its eyes? Is it on this end? No, nah, that's the tail. It's on this end here. Still tough to find, right? There's an eye right here. I think that's the eye right there. So now this fish has been living for a while. It has color to it and it has eyes on two sides, or sorry, on both eyes are on one side of its body. Okay, um, now do the eyes go through the head? It doesn't actually pop through the head from one side to the other um, for most of them, but there are some that it does do that. Um, for the California halibut that we have here at the Aquarium of the Pacific, it actually, this, this one right here, um, it actually does move up and over. And uh, let's see. My friend Amanda actually gave me some, some words here. I'm going to read this to y'all. Um, the bones in its skull bend and shift as one eye forces its way to the other side of its head. By the time the skull is fully ossified or hardened, the eyes are permanently fixed. Whoa. <laughs> I love this. We're learning together. So I knew that it moved, but that's a, that's a much more explicit way. Um, involved in detailed way of knowing how that eye moves. So there are so many different fish out there in the ocean and they all have unique stories of their own. Um, and I encourage you, if you are interested in learning more about fish, to look into it because you never know what you're going to find. There's so many bizarre uh, stories out there. Now, I do think it'd be interesting to um, take a look at one of our webcams to, uh, to see what some of the fish are up to here at the Aquarium of the Pacific. Now we do have webcams in a handful of exhibits that we have here at the aquarium, usually our most popular ones. And um, it allows you to take a peek inside even if you're not here at the aquarium. Now sometimes we run them live. So um, you can see exactly what's happening inside that exhibit. Sometimes it's actually highlights because uh, we wanna make sure that you get to see kind of the coolest moments of that exhibit. So we're going to bring one of them up for us to take a look at. Now this here is our Blue Cavern exhibit. And our Blue Cavern exhibit is um, a representation of a real dive site here in Southern California off the coast of Catalina Island, which is pretty close to um, LA and Long Beach. Now one of the really neat things about this exhibit are these little ones right here. These are sardines. And they make up a good number of the fish that we have here because we have a bunch in this school. Oh, hey, look at that. Oh, this side. Mm, there you go. Look at the 
shark. This is a unique shark called a horn shark. It does not come out very often. So it's neat that we got to see it. This is, um, so back to the, the sardines again. So sardines are schooling fish, which means that they do hang out all together and they do tend to like to go in the same direction too. So if you watch them, they kind of follow each other around. And you may wonder how they can do this without crashing into each other. Because, I mean, if you had a whole bunch of people hanging out together and they were all trying to walk in the same direction without talking to each other, we'd probably crash into each other often. Don't try that at home right now. We need some social distance. But um, it, does, it works for these fish and that's because they have a very special part of their body that can help them sense what other fish around them are doing or what the water is even doing around them. All along the side of their body, they actually have a line called a lateral line. And if you were to see a fish up close, you might even see a line there. And they basically have these hair-like structures along their lateral line that can feel the way that the water moves around them. So they can feel what the fish next to them is doing. If it's turning right, the water moves different. And so they know to turn right. If the fish is turning to the left, the water moves different so they can both turn to the left. That's one of the way that fish can actually navigate around in a school and uh, not bump and crash into each other. So very cool fish adaptations. Now, not all fish school like this. Some fish are loners. We have a couple here that are kind of hanging out by themselves. Some fish even do this thing called shoaling. Shoaling means they hang out together, but they're not all going in the same direction. Do you remember that first uh, exhibit that we were looking at, the Antheus exhibit with all the really, really colorful fish? Those are big time shoalers. They like to hang out with their buddies, but they don't all wanna go in the same direction. They're kind of doing their own thing close to some other buddies. That again is shoaling. All right, everyone. Well, it is time for us to finish up for the day. Thank you all so much for joining us for our fish exploration. I hope you find this fish as interesting as I do and uh, keep learning about them because I think the more you look at them, the more interesting they become. Oh, that's a, that's a good question. How many sardines can be in a group? A last question here, a lot. <laughs> thousands. Um, in fact, in our exhibit alone, we have had thousands of sardines together. But out in the ocean, you can get giant schools of thousands and thousands and thousands. So it's pretty neat to be able to see something like that. And they are, um, as one of my friends, Alicia, likes to say, the chicken nuggets of the sea. They are definitely a feeder fish. Okay, everyone, it's time for me to sign off. Thanks so much for joining us today. Bye.